Well, again, it's good to have you all with us this morning. It's a blessing in spite of the ice and all that you all could be here. I'd like to welcome those that are tuning in at this time to uh, watch the message here at Bethel Bible Chapel. It is a, a good day and it is a great time. We are in the book of Hebrews and what a fantastic book because it points to a wonderful Savior. And so this morning... Our brother Mark Salomon will be coming, and he will be in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Mark? Indeed, we're thankful for God's watch care to bring us here this morning. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope your Valentine's Day got off on the right foot. Mine did not. <laughs> I got up this morning and... Decided I'd grab a couple things and go out and clear a little snow, and I didn't realize that it was ice, and I took the wrong way down half a dozen concrete steps. So I'm a little banged up this morning, but after lying there a few minutes, I decided nothing major. So my, va my Valentine's Day really didn't get out to either the right foot or the left foot, I suppose. I think it's fitting that today is Valentine's Day, given what we're studying. Probably a lot of people out there, maybe even a lot of people in here, who sent cards or flowers or candy or hearts or whatever all we send on Valentine's Day, don't even know the legends, the stories behind St. Valentine's. And we don't know how many of them are true. But one of the most propagated stories about the man called St. Valentine is that he was a Roman priest about one and three quarter millennia ago, quite a while ago, who was imprisoned by an emperor in Rome, Claudius the Cruel, Claudius II. Claudius had come to the conclusion, he had a lot, a lot of wars going on, and he had come to the conclusion that his soldiers would fight better if they didn't have home attachments. So he forbid his soldiers to marry. Some also think that it might have been an economic move, figuring that single soldiers were gonna require less pay than married soldiers. At any rate, whatever his motivation was, he forbid soldiers in his empire to marry. Well, many of them had a problem with that, understandably so. And St. Valentine, a Roman priest, had a problem with that, understanding marriage as being instituted by God, an institution between a man and a woman who love each other and decide to come together in a way that God himself established in the Garden of Eden. And so Valentine would perform the marriage ceremonies for these soldiers and their wives. Claudius found out, had him thrown into jail. While in jail, Valentine actually became somewhat a favorite of the jailer and a good friend with the jailer's daughter. And on the night before his execution, so the story goes, he sent the jailer's daughter a note and signed it, your Valentine. And one of the stories about Valentine's Day is that we have come from that some 1750 years ago to the Valentine's Day that we know today. Well, why do I think that's significant? Well, it's because St. Valentine, a Roman priest, gave his life for the institution of marriage so that men and women who love each other could marry. Today, we are going to be talking about a high priest who gave his life so that he could become our bridegroom, the bridegroom of the church. So isn't that an interesting connection? that we're doing this today on Valentine's Day. Before we go further, let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, for the opportunity to gather together, that you have seen over us coming here safely and gathering to worship and gathering to look into your word. And as we look into your word this day, may we see the love that you have for us. May we see your plan. May we see that you are our high priest, our bridegroom, you sent Christ to be these things, to be our Savior above all, and He gave His blood. So on a day that celebrates red, help us to remember that. We ask now that this time would be committed to you these next few minutes in your word. In Christ's precious name, amen. Some of you probably remember about 15 years back that a company started doing a series of commercials that were based on the most interesting man in the world. They were rather silly, a good looking old gentleman who would be remembering some absolutely insane memory he had of doing something that obviously wasn't real, wasn't rational. 
But the commercials actually took the country by storm. They quote unquote went viral, became quite popular. The most interesting man in the world. Well, you know what? I think the author of Hebrews found his most interesting man in the world. Because when we look at the Old Testament, we find a grand total of four verses that mention Melchizedek. Four verses in the entirety of the Old Testament. When we compare that to most of the significant Old Testament characters, it's next to nothing. And then, look at the book of Hebrews, starting in chapter 5, and I'll just jump ahead to verse 6 of chapter 5. He says also in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 10, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7, whoops, I'm still in chapter 6. Chapter 7, or chapter 6, I was correct the first time. Chapter 6, verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Moving into chapter 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning. I won't read all of that now because I'll be reading that a little bit later. Melchizedek's mentioned again in verse 10. He's mentioned again in verse 15. He's mentioned again in verse 16. This man, who has four verses total in the Old Testament, receives the bulk of three chapters in the book of Hebrews. How could you possibly build that? I mean, from a standpoint of somebody who's prepared a few sermons in his lifetime, it would be very difficult for me to take four verses and turn them into three chapters worth, I think. Although I'm probably verbose enough I could manage, but not as well as the author of Hebrews. He was fascinated by this character of Melchizedek. And so we should be too. And I know Bill spoke a lot about Melchizedek about a month or so ago. We're going to speak about a lot of the same things because apparently the author of Hebrews felt it was worth repeating several times, so we better repeat it a couple times. And we're going to start in Genesis 14, but we're actually going to move even further back than that to Genesis 3, but we'll start in 14 and then get back into more of a chronological order. I want to get into Genesis 14 because that's where we meet Melchizedek. We're not going to bother setting up the historical circumstance behind it. It's not really necessary for right now. Suffice to say there was war, but there's always war. So we're just going to pick it up in Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was priest of God Most High. He blessed him, him being Abram, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven, er heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, he gave him a tenth of all. He being Abram gave him Melchizedek a tenth of all. This is the entirety of the background we have for Melchizedek. The only other Old Testament verse we have is Psalm 110.4 where God says you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there are a lot of interesting things about that verse too but I don't know how much time we'll spend on that. I want to talk about a few things in these verses before we go back to Genesis 3. You may have noticed, and I don't know what translation you have, but I omitted a word that is in my translation when I read that. My translation says, now he was a priest of God Most High. A better translation would be, now he was priest of God Most High. I had the occasion to look at a little of the Hebrew this week, and I wasn't surprised to note that this was the first example of the Hebrew word in Scripture. Bill had pointed out a few weeks back that it was the first time we have the word priest. I just wanted to check if there were any other occurrences that weren't translated. But I found something that really hit me. The Hebrew word for priest is Kohen. A lot of you may know that. No big deal if you don't. Well, you know it now, I suppose, if you're listening. But So Melchizedek is called Kohen, priest of God Most High. As I was looking through examples in the Scripture, I was intrigued to note that Cohen is seldom used just in that way. Most of the time it is used as ha Cohen, which means the priest in the Hebrew language. So that intrigued me. Aaron, the priest. Eli, the priest. Whoever happened to be priest. They're all the priest. Not with Melchizedek. It didn't say he was the priest of God Most High. It just said he was priest of God Most High. No qualifier. And I thought that was interesting in light of what the author says in Hebrews, and we'll get there in a little bit, but you know, 
Aaron was the priest until he died. Aaron's son was the priest until he died. Aaron's grandson, you get the idea. I don't need to go through any more generations. Melchizedek is not mentioned that way. Melchizedek was just, boom, priest. And the first mention of that word. Now, it is the first mention of that word. It is decidedly not the first actions of a priest in the Old Testament. Not by a long shot. We're going to go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, and again, I'll skip a lot of the background because I think pretty much everybody listening knows the background. Adam and Eve have fallen. They've sinned. They've done what they're not supposed to do. And as a result, they have recognized their sin, their guilt, and their shame. And we are told, uh, missing the verse here. There's the verse, verse 7 of Genesis 3. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Skipping over all that and all the way to verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Apparently, Adam and Eve were not good enough at sewing. No, I don't think that's what it was. They made themselves clothing, but it didn't suffice. Why didn't it suffice? Well, I think there's actually more than one reason here. The first and probably the most obvious to us is that when they sewed fig leaves together, no blood was shed. I've seen fig trees and I don't think they bleed. The Lord God made coverings of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them, a blood sacrifice. But you know what else is significant there? And I'd missed this up until now, or at least I hadn't given it the thought I should have. God didn't say, Adam and Eve, go find a sheep or a goat, or whatever, and go sacrifice it, and pour out the blood, and skin it, and make yourself clothing. God did it himself. Because God, and I believe that was a Christophany, I believe that was Jesus Christ in the flesh, in an appearance before his incarnation, in case anybody's wondering about Christophany, I believe that that was Jesus Christ himself doing it himself, not telling Adam and Eve to do it, because Adam and Eve needed a perfect, sinless high priest right then. They could not make the sacrifice for themselves. It would have been insufficient. I'm reminded in the book of Leviticus, and I want to say off the top of my head that it's chapter 16, but I didn't look it up, shame on me. But one of those chapters in Leviticus details the Day of Atonement and everything that needs to be done. And one of the things that you note is that before Aaron or his sons, whoever the high priest was, before they could go into the holiest place, they had to atone first for themselves. There was a sacrifice first that was not connected to the Day of Atonement sacrifice because the priest himself had to be holy, had to be perfect, had to be sinless. Understand how I'm saying that. He did not somehow become sinless by his sacrifice, but that blood covered his sin and made him for ceremonial purposes, sinless. Amen. And so in Genesis 3, we do not find God telling Adam and Eve to go sacrifice. We find God himself doing it because only he could suffice as priest. And that should get our eyes focused right away on what the author of Hebrews has been saying for a couple of chapters and continues to say in verse 7. Needed a perfect high priest. A human priest simply wouldn't do. Now that doesn't mean that human priests didn't exist. In the very next narrative in Genesis, as we move into chapter 4, Adam and Eve have a couple sons. They probably had a lot more kids than just this. We know they had to have more kids than just this or none of us would be here. But two are mentioned, Cain and Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, Cain was a tiller of the ground, verse 3 of chapter 4. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. Now, much has been said and speculated about exactly why God accepted Abel's and not Cain's. The passage makes it clear that Abel gave of the best, 
the first portion and the fat portion. It does not make that clear of Cain, but it also doesn't say he didn't. It just says that he brought of it. It doesn't say what specifically he brought. But I think there are a couple things there to learn. One is obvious. God wants our best. Go through the ceremonial laws, the sacrificial laws, and see that God always expected a sacrifice without blemish. Not because God needed that, but because what it represented. Because we needed a sacrifice without blemish to, in the Old Testament, cover our sins, in the New Testament, to expunge them forever. We needed a perfect sacrifice. And that's kind of an interesting lesson when you think about Cain and Abel. If Cain indeed did just throw something together, that's something to think about, well, in many walks of life, but how about for those of us who stand up here? As we prepare to open the Word, you know, what are we giving of our time when we prepare? Is it our best time, our time when we can focus on what God wants us to say? Or are we just kind of squeezing it in somewhere in the busyness of life so we can do our duty on the Sunday that we're assigned a particular text or passage? And I'm sure those of you who don't speak can also make applications in your life, but that was one that came to me as I was thinking about it. Those of us who stand up and speak, we need to make sure that this is the best of our time, that we are giving the best of our effort, we are giving the best of what we have to open up the Scripture to you these mornings. We owe it to you, but we owe it to God much more. So just a little thing that we can all stop and think about. But what else about it? You know, some have pointed out that at the time of Cain and Abel, at least as far as recorded scripture, there had been no command that the sacrifice had to be blood. And that's true. There had been no, well, I shouldn't, at least written, there is none. We don't know what God specifically told Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. But I believe they should already have known from what we saw at the end of chapter 3. Because we saw that God didn't say your fig leaf clothing is good enough. God said there's going to be an animal skin, there's going to be a sacrifice, there's going to be the shedding of blood. And so even though the verse, without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins, may not have shown up in Genesis 3 and 4, it's there! Just not in so many words. It should have been evident already, and since it was evident to Adam and Eve, and their sons, it was evident to all of humanity. Have you noticed that in a study of religion all around the world, blood sacrifice, animal sacrifice is central to most of them, even in remote areas? God has instilled this in man's heart. Whether it is some form of revelation from God to man that continues or whether it's something that was passed down generation to generation and as much was lost, this somehow remained. On some level, we all understand that it has to happen that way, don't we? Even apart from scriptural revelation, although scriptural revelation certainly makes it abundantly more clear. We need scriptural revelation. All this perhaps is a long-winded way of pointing out there is priestly activity well before Melchizedek. I don't mean to imply that just because the word priest does not appear until there that the concept does not exist. We can see it numerous other places. Noah comes off of the ark. What's one of the first things he does? In chapter 8 and verse 20 of Genesis, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. It was apparent to Noah. He functioned as a priest, as a head of the household, as a head of the household of all humanity. Job. Job is a great illustration, and he may have been a contemporary with Abraham. We don't know exactly when he lived. I'm not going to flip to Job to take the time, but you may recall that in the very first chapter of Job, it talks about Job constantly offering sacrifices on behalf of his children just in case they've sinned. And at the end of the book, Job offers offerings on behalf of his three friends who have, for about 30 chapters, given him a dickens of a time about his life. Now that was according to God, and he said, Job's going to offer these offerings, Job's going to pray for you, and I'm going to heal you. 
And Job's three friends kind of, we, 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 we give them a rough go, but they were the only three friends who were there and they sat with them a week before they even talked. So, you know, e even though they gave them the business in some cases, they were pretty good friends in some other ways. Miserable comforters though they might be, as Job calls them. Job functioned as a priest for his family, for his friends. Priestly activity was not unknown before Melchizedek, even if the word does not show up. But then the word does show up there. In Genesis chapter 14, we now have a man who is priest of God Most High. And he comes out and he says, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And that, of course, refers to God, not Abram. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. There's an interesting concept that I need to mention, a Jewish concept, and Bill started touching on it a little bit a month or so ago when he talked about the fact that he has a friend, a Jewish believer, probably a Messianic Jew, I think he said is the term he went by, who believes a Jewish tradition that says that Melchizedek was Shem. And Bill pointed out a number of the problems with that in the book of Hebrews. The Jewish tradition actually teaches that Melchizedek, by starting his blessing, by saying, blessed be Abram, instead of blessed being God, passed the line of priesthood on to Abram and his seed at that point. That has no basis anywhere in Scripture, I want to point out. And I was looking at the Hebrew words to try to find if there was a basis to that, and I found some interesting things. I shouldn't have put my glasses down already. I just hate keeping them with me, but... Okay, I'm going to get them back out so I can read. Psalm 110, verse 4. Gave you plenty of time to get there because I'm being slow getting there myself. I'll start at verse 1. It's a good chapter. Well, they all are, right? The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I looked up the Hebrew word there for order and found it to be very interesting because the word through scripture or at least variants of the word get translated in a whole host of other ways. It was a word I recognized from both biblical and modern Hebrew so it gave me a lot of things to think about but interestingly enough it's a word that is related for speaking. It's related to words for speaking or talking. It has a much broader definition it can simply mean a thing. Sometimes in Scripture, it's translated as a cause or even an estate. So there's a whole lot going into this word. Hebrew, unfortunately, has a very small vocabulary, so words have to mean a whole lot of different things sometimes. But I thought that was a really interesting... According to the cause of Melchizedek. What do you think of that? The cause of Melchizedek. What was Melchizedek's cause? Melchizedek's cause, from all we have in Scripture about him, was blessing God Most High, serving him as priest. Now, I, I will insert here that there is a lot of debate on who Melchizedek was besides the Jewish tradition that says he was Shem, which Bill disproved sufficiently a month ago. I won't go into any further. A lot of believers believe that he was a type of Christ. Some believe he was actually a pre-incarnate Christ, another Christophany. I fall into that category, but it's not my interest this morning to try to convince you one way or the other because the limited biographical detail we have for him, it simply doesn't make a good strong argument one way or the other. I believe there are a number of things we can point out that we're not going to worry about. That's not the point. The point is to learn what it's talking definitely about Christ in Hebrew. But think about Melchizedek's cause, no matter who he was. Melchizedek's cause was to worship God Most High and to point people toward him and, since he was a priest, a Kohen, to sacrifice on behalf of their sin and see their sins covered, expunged. And that, my friends, must be why the author of Hebrews 
found this Melchizedek the most interesting man in the world. So let's get to our passage now. I've only taken half my time in the warm-up. <clears throat> for this Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, as it said exactly in the Old Testament as well, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham appointed, apportioned, excuse me, a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. That's exactly right. Of course, it's in Scripture, so it better be. Melchizedek, boy, you feel, you feel like you're getting a Hebrew lesson today yet? Melchizedek, Melchizedek, King of Righteousness. That is exactly what his name means. Now, that is probably, if Melchizedek was indeed a normal human being and not a Christophany, that is probably not a birth name. That does not seem like a name that would be likely to be given to somebody <laughs> at, at their naming as a little baby, King of Righteousness. If so, that would be somewhat arrogant, hoping that the child would turn out that way, wouldn't it? It is a descriptive name, as many names are in Scripture. This man is King of Righteousness. If he's not a Christophany, he's a really good type of Christ. He is the example of who Christ should be, and by extension of who we should be, since we are to follow Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, Paul wrote. So we could fill that in and say, be imitators of Melchizedek, as Melchizedek is an imitator of Christ. King of righteousness, and also king of peace, king of Salem. A simple term, but one that points us toward a lot of history. Jerusalem. At the time of Melchizedek, Jerusalem wasn't much. It was there, but it probably wasn't a whole lot. It may have been a walled city by that time. We don't know. But it was pretty minor, as most were. I should probably point out that the concept of a king at this point in time was probably not what you and I think of. We don't have kings here in the United States. Some countries still have kings. Most of them don't really have political authority anymore. They're figureheads. But when we think of a king, we think of a ruler over a large area, don't we? King of England. Well, England's had a queen for a long time, but still, if you think of royalty, England's probably what you think of first. Well, you had kings of these tiny little city-states. If Melchizedek was indeed a human king, he was, I apologize for the term, relatively insignificant, humanly speaking. There were a whole bunch around like him, except they weren't kings of righteousness and kings of peace. At this point in time, we do know that Jerusalem existed as a settlement, a village, a city, whatever you want to call it. Rushlamim was probably the approximate pronunciation at that point. Later on, it would be Er Shalem. Eventually, it would become known as Yerushalayim as we know it. That comes. Here we are, more Hebrew language. I did so much Hebrew with this one. Il Shalom, city of peace in Hebrew. Er Shalem, Yerushalayim. City of peace. He is king of the city of peace. He is king of righteousness, and he is king of peace. Who better to point us toward Christ? Who better, if not a Christophany, to be a type of Christ than someone who can be termed King of Righteousness and King of Peace? By the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now that is obviously a verse where you need to make a decision, okay, is that actually describing Christ or is that describing Melchizedek as a type of Christ or a Christophany? And again, I'm not interested in trying to convince you one way or the other. The point about it could very well be, we don't know his genealogy. We don't know his mother and father. As I said, we got four verses about Melchizedek in the Old Testament. We know pretty much nothing about him. If we did, we wouldn't have to have the question whether he's Christophany or not, right? We'd know. We don't know. There is so much about him that we don't know. 
But from a scriptural standpoint, his genealogy isn't given. We don't know his mother and father. We don't know his line. I mean, if, if he were an actual physical human being and not a Christophany, he was probably a Canaanite king there in Jerusalem. Which there could be a lot of lessons we could draw from that as well. Because we know who the Canaanites were, but then we know who the Moabites were, and God pulled Ruth out of there and into the line of Christ, didn't he? So if he was a Canaanite king, eh, God can use a Canaanite king and anybody else. A Moabite woman. A man, a first century man who slew Christians until on the road to Damascus. If Melchizedek was a Canaanite, no problem. God used him just fine. But we don't know. We don't know that genealogy, beginning of days or end of life. We don't know when he lived. You know, that's something. And what I tried to find about history of Jerusalem, there is nothing about this man except what's in Scripture. And I think that's what the author of Hebrews was saying. We don't know anything about this guy. Maybe the author of Hebrews didn't even know if he was a Christophany or not. Maybe he was... <laughs> he doesn't even say one way or the other, does he? Maybe he thought, well, maybe he is, maybe he's not. Maybe the first century church was just as divided as we are on that. When I say divided, this is not an important division. Don't worry about this division. Dad, Dad doesn't agree with me. It's all good. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's starting to agree with me. I don't know, but probably not yet. <laughs> but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually, forever. Remember what I talked about back in Genesis 14. It doesn't say he was the priest. It just says he was priest. And it's repeated again in that Psalm passage, by the way. It didn't put the the in there either. Most Old Testament references say ha and the priest. The ones for Melchizedek did not. He was priest. And Jesus Christ is priest perpetually. The Levitical priesthood wasn't. He talks about it. Aaron died. Aaron's sons died. His son's sons died. All the way down the line. They were priests for a brief time. In fact, there was even more than just death that cut it off. When we look at the prescriptions for the priests, they only had 20 years where they were supposed to serve in the priesthood. Now, due to population issues, that time got expanded. By the time of Christ, they had a longer time to be priests because there just weren't enough to fulfill all the service. But they were only to be priests for a brief amount of time, relatively speaking. This one is perpetual. This one is forever. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those in deeds of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. What is the author saying here? Well, what do we know about the Levitical priesthood? When the ch children of Israel come into the land, we commonly talk about the 12 tribes, don't we? Were there 12 tribes? There were 13. There are 12 plus 1. Joseph was given a double portion, and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, both become named as tribe, which means now we have 13. But when they come into the land, 12 of them receive a specific allotment of land in a certain area, and the Levites are scattered around the land. And God says, you will be my portion. We're not going to give you one area that's going to be known as Levi. The way we've got an area called Ephraim, an area called Judah, an area called Benjamin, etc. I am your portion and you're going to serve me. And they would be called to the temple service. Well, to the tabernacle first and then to the temple once it was built. So how did the Levites subsist? They subsisted on the tithes. The people from the other 12 tribes provided, well, the people were to provide. We know they didn't do a very good job of it. But they were to provide with their tithes for the priests, for the Levites. And those tithes were going to allow them to do what they were supposed to do before God. Abraham gives Melchizedek a tithe, a tenth part of the spoil of the war he had just been in. Abraham acknowledges the priesthood of Melchizedek. And the author of Hebrews makes a point out of this.
to say that this was Levi expressing himself as subordinate to the priesthood of Melchizedek, jumping down to 9 and 10, and then we'll get back to where we're supposed to be. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. Levi would not be born for well over half a century after Abraham died. But one of the things we find out in Scripture is sometimes in genealogies, individuals who aren't relevant are skipped over. And while I'm not suggesting that Isaac and Jacob are not relevant individuals in Scripture, for this passage they're not. For this passage, Abraham and Levi are relevant because Abraham is the one who pays tithes to Melchizedek and his great-grandson Levi is the one from whom the priestly line and the temple servants come. And so he says, through Abraham, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the greater. This Melchizedek, if he's not the most interesting man in the world, he sure is pretty interesting, isn't he? Four verses in the Old Testament. And then we get all this. Observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. The Jews hold Abraham in pretty high regard, for good reason. But here is Abraham subordinating himself to Melchizedek. Here is Abraham, who would not subordinate himself to the king of Sodom, by the way. Remember what the king of Sodom said? You, know, you can keep the goods for yourself, just give me back the people. Abraham said, ah, you keep all the goods. This was not a tithe. This would have been a king-vassal relationship. The king of Sodom was trying to say, Abraham is my servant and I'm rewarding him for what he's done with these spoils. Uh-uh-uh-uh. None of that, Abraham says. I don't serve the king of Sodom. I serve the Most High God. And I give a tithe to his priest who is either our Savior incarnate or a type, a representation of him. Again, you can come to whatever conclusion you want. Not interested in trying to convince you one way or the other on that. So he continues, And those indeed of the sons of Levi who receive the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. Abraham's own descendants are paying tithes to Abraham's own descendants, the Levites. It's not because of who the Levites are in and of themselves. It's because God has chosen them. The Levites don't compare to Melchizedek here. He doesn't say how great the Levites were. He says how great this man to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoil is. But the one, verse 6, whose genealogy is not traced from them, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. That is Melchizedek, the one whose genealogy is not traced from them. Melchizedek collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one, Abraham, who had the promises. Remember the promises to Abraham? Genesis 12, reiterated. Genesis 15, reiterated again and again. Remember Abraham taking his son, Isaac, up to Mount Moriah and stretching out the knife there on the same hill where Christ would later die. Actually, that's an interesting thing. Why doesn't Melchizedek show up there? I don't know. <laughs> I honestly have no answer for that. It's something that I've been thinking about for weeks, literally. Is that, you know, why doesn't Melchizedek show up there? After all, King of Salem, that's his backyard. Well, two possible answers. One is that he was a Christophany and the tithe had already been paid and there was no need. Two, he was a human king and a lot of years had passed and he was no, no longer on the throne because humans get old and die. I don't know. Doesn't answer the question. I just wonder, you know, where was he in that? But again, as a reminder, Jerusalem was a pretty small, insignificant city at that point. So Abraham and Isaac probably could have gone up there with not too many people being much the wiser. When David conquers Jerusalem several centuries later, or perhaps I should say when Joab conquers Jerusalem on behalf of David, do you know how big Jerusalem was, the walled city portion? Between 9 and 11 acres. 
So don't, don't get yourself fooled into thinking that these are some massive city like we would think of. I mean, 9 to 11 acres, that wouldn't even qualify as a tiny village today, would it? If Melchizedek was indeed a Canaanite king, he was an insignificant king. But he was priest of God Most High. And so we're told, observe how great this man was. So if indeed he was king of a 10-acre city, he was great, but not because he was king of a 10-acre city, but because he was Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Salem, king of peace, priest of Most High God. That's what made him great, not his genealogy. The Levites weren't great because of their genealogy. You just caught that. They collected from their people who had the same genealogy. They were from Abraham too. But without any dispute, verse 7, without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. There were no two ways about that in Old Testament times. The king would collect tribute from those below him. He would give spoils to those below him. You understand the difference? A king goes out to war and he and his forces win the battle and they win spoil and they bring it back and the king distributes it as he sees fit among those who helped him win the battle. But a vassal, a servant of the king, is required to give him tribute, to pay a tithe, to pay, what word do we all know, a tax. We might not have kings today, but it sure seems like it sometimes. Okay, no, no politics. We don't need to go down that line. But we understand the difference. The lesser is blessed by the greater. Abraham pays the tithe to Melchizedek. Melchizedek blesses him. Although really what Melchizedek does is he blesses God when you look at it, doesn't he? Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high. That's back to the Genesis. I didn't flip back in case you're wondering that was, where that was from. Without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, in the case of Levi, mortal men receive tithes. What do we talk about? Aaron, his son's son. They die. Aaron was the priest. Now guess what? He's not now. He hasn't been for 3,400 years or something like that. Aaron's son died. His son's son died. Mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, the case of Melchizedek, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. Of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And you may say, isn't that absolute proof that Melchizedek is a Christophany if he lives on? Not necessarily. Because we'd go back to that Psalm. I, I know I'm arguing against my position now, but I'm trying, I'm trying to establish how this is not clear. In Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That establishes that his priestly order, his cause, lives on forever. Not necessarily that he does. It's my opinion that he does, but like I said, I'm not trying to argue either way. I want to lay it all out, let you make your decision. This is what Scripture tells us. God doesn't give us all the answers. I guess life would be easier if he did, but he gives us what we need to know. And hey, we wouldn't have any fun if we didn't have something to debate, right? Only a couple of you reacted well to that. I don't know. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them whom it is witnessed that he lives on Melchizedek line lives on forever and so to speak through Abraham even Levi who received tithes paid tithes for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him what's the upshot of this Melchizedek is a representation of Christ or Christ himself either way the children of Abraham not descended from Levi pay the Levites tithes and Levi, through his great-grandfather Abraham, paid tithes to Melchizedek. Either way, it makes it abundantly clear about the priesthood. See, there's a real problem and a real misunderstanding in a lot of churches, or perhaps I'll even just expand it and say a lot of religions today. There's the thought of needing a human priest. Oh, we did need a human priest, didn't we? Oh, but we got one who dwells forever after the order of Melchizedek. How many times did the author of Hebrews say that? Four different times. And Melchizedek's only mentioned four verses in the Old Testament. Four different times. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
Do you know somebody who goes by the title priest today? If it's anybody other than Jesus Christ, they're a charlatan, whether they know it or not. Because the priesthood was never meant to be a sinful human being. If it was, in Genesis 3, God would have told Adam, go make a sacrifice on behalf of yourself and your wife. Oh yes, the Levitical priesthood was established to stand in between. But even that priesthood was imperfect and the priest had to make a sacrifice on behalf of himself before he could do anything on behalf of the people. Just so God would accept him when he went to make that sacrifice. But then we get the difference. Melchizedek. When we look at Old Testament characters, and it's often noted how chapters like Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith, and others always paint the Old Testament patriarchs beautifully. Whereas when we read the Old Testament, we see all the foibles and follies and warts and failures of our Old Testament heroes, don't we? Do you notice that Melchizedek didn't have any listed? Because Melchizedek represented the perfect priest, and it took a perfect priest. Melchizedek would not have sufficed as a type of Christ if the scripture had listed one sin, one failure, one shortcoming that he had. But it doesn't. Because he had to abide as a priest perpetually in perfection. And so nothing is mentioned. We have a perfect high priest and one who fits as a qualifier both because he is perfect God and because he became man for us, Jesus Christ. And the author of Hebrews felt it necessary to devote the bulk of three chapters to that simple truth. So maybe it's not as simple a truth as I said it is, or maybe we just need to spend a little more time thinking about it, pondering it, focused on it, remembering it, especially when we live surrounded by a world who uses the title priest. As far as I know, St. Valentine, who I talked about at the beginning, had the title priest. You know what? From what I know about him, he was probably a good man. He wasn't truly a priest. Not in the biblical sense. Lord, help us to understand these truths today. Jesus Christ is priest. High priest, the only priest. He shed his blood once on the cross so that sin could be expunged forever. Lord, if there's anyone listening to my words who has tried to depend on anything else, be it another priest, another religious system, their own works, whatever, help us to realize that there is no other system and there is no other option. Jesus is the better priest. He is the only true priest. He is the only option. And we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that we're told in James, no one comes to the Father but by me, but he opens it to everybody. We can all come to the Father by him. Lord, we thank you for that. May we be impressed and re-impressed by the person of Christ, by the person of Melchizedek, by the truths that the author of Hebrews lays out for us. And we give you the honor and the glory for it. In the precious name of Christ our Savior, amen.